Our next speaker is Dr. Sonia Brookins Santelisis. Now, I am very cynical about bureaucrats, and it comes from many years being a bureaucrat. Um, <laughs> Dr. Santelisis is the chief academic officer for the Baltimore City Public Schools. Since her appointment, Dr. Santelisis has focused on setting academic priorities for city schools to booster the achievement of students across all schools. I have been wondering for a very long time, we've had a succession of CEOs of our public school system, and each of them seemed to have one failure after the other. Then we have Dr. Alonzo, and our school system, though still terribly troubled, seems to really be turning the corner. And I couldn't figure out, because I've met him several times, so I couldn't figure out, how are we being so successful? I've met him. Um, <laughs> And then it dawned on me when I attended a conference and one of the speakers was Dr. Santelisis. She blew us away with not only her understanding of how to educate children, but she has a love and a passion for children. Would you welcome the Chief Academic Officer of the Baltimore City Public Schools, Dr. Sonia Santelisis. Good afternoon. It's great to be here. And one of the tasks that I have for you today is to pose a question that I would like you to reflect on, and very much in the Socratic tradition of uh, Bobby McDonald, who went earlier today. My question is really centered around um, a story that some students of mine, oh, about a decade and a half ago, first posed and didn't even realize they were doing doing it. We were sitting um, in northern uh, New York, slightly in Carmel, New York, actually, slightly north of the city. And my students, who were all from Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, which is very much as I tell people here when they don't know where Bedford-Stuyvesant is, I said, well, think North Avenue, think Cher Cherry Hill. Whatever that section is for you, that's Bedford-Stuyvesant. And so a group of, um, I had the advantage of sitting on a group of our middle school boys, young men, and they were with their teacher at the time, uh, Mr. Watson, who was leading them through a small group exercise, very much like a, um, a mentoring group or a, uh, a check-in. And one of the questions he posed was a very simple question, one that I'm sure all of us at some point in our lifetimes have posed ourselves, uh, posed to ourselves or others have posed to us. And it was the question of, what do you want to be doing in five or 10 years? And I sat ready to kind of listen and take stock, excuse me, of what tends to be kind of the normal responses. I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a firefighter. And instead, the responses I heard um, caused me to really ponder and think about long term, what is this work that is urban education? As the young men, and I'll never forget some of the names, and I'll only use first names, but as Mark and Deshaun and uh, Jamal began to have this conversation around this question that was posed, suddenly a very simple question became very loaded. Their answers were, well, how far in the future do you want me to go? Seemingly a simple question, but when the response was, well, try 10 years. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to be here in 10 years, so can I do three years? And then goes on, then Mark and some of his colleagues go on to then describe, well, okay, in addition to knowing how long, right, what exactly do you want me to talk about? Do you want me to talk about the good stuff, right, the stuff that you want to hear me say I want to do, or the stuff that I really think I'll be able to do, right? And that even at the age of 11 and 12, they could differentiate that the questions that we were asking had kind of stock answers that um, what I would say my children or some of your children would, would, um, would respond. But they internally had already distinguished between the stock answers of maybe a doctor, maybe a lawyer. But in reality, I'll be really happy if I can just get a job at one of the local fast food restaurants if I can just stay alive, if I can just dodge drug dealers, um, and if I can, frankly, get out of the neighborhood. And so as I sat and listened, one of the questions that stayed with me, um, not only from that time almost a decade and a half ago to now, is this question of leadership. So this question that I pose to you is one 
of what is the role of urban schooling? And are we really about the business of creating leaders, growing leaders, or are we just in the business of helping a group of young people keep their noses clean so that they stay off of our lawns, that they don't break into our cars, and they generally just leave us alone? Because this question fundamentally, I would argue, is the question that we're faced with now. So when I walk into classrooms in Baltimore with this frame, I see education that answers this question two ways for young people. In far too many of our classrooms still, the question is answered, I just want you to keep your nose clean. We ask kids to come in, we ask them to file silently, we ask them to sit and be quiet, we ask them to fill out rote worksheets, we ask them to not cause too much commotion, and whatever you do, please stay quiet. And in other rooms, in other classrooms, where teachers push against the tide that says, just, just educate kids to help make our lives less troublesome, what you see is what I would call education for leadership. And that fundamentally is the question, because what I submit to you is that, frankly, where our society is today and the questions that we are faced with we do not have enough leaders being generated from the traditional places that we look for leadership. We don't have enough leaders being educated in places like the Park School or my alma mater, Brown University. We don't have enough leaders coming from there. We like to think that we do, but we don't. And so fundamentally, the question that I have posed to every leader in the city of Baltimore who leads a school is will you lead, will you lead educationally in a way that also produces leaders? So part of that question, we, at, we answer with this question of what then does our education need to look like and what are the first steps in getting there? And we have identified three steps. And I pose these not as the recipe, not as the answer to everything, but merely the portals through which we ask ourselves the questions that will eventually make sure that every young person in Baltimore and across urban centers, and in urban centers across the country, right, actually have experiences that say to them, we want you to lead. The first of that is this question of rigor. What do we mean by rigor? Right? Is it a simple definition? Is it more? One of my favorite examples is um, a teacher back in, uh, in Boston, where I was previous to coming to Baltimore, said to me when I asked about this question of rigor, she said, oh, well, when we talked about rigor the first time, I just kind of figured you meant we needed to do more, give more homework problems. Right? I figured what you meant was we were only giving them five and we probably needed to give them 15. To which I answered, actually, I want you to ask yourself what is rigor. And part of this question of rigor is really centered in the idea of complex analysis, of questioning, of pushing, of when are we asking students to create, when are we asking them to question, and question not in just theoretical ways. Because one of the things that I tell people is that urban kids are some of the smartest kids I've ever met. And they can ask the questions and they can analyze in very much the same way that that first group of young boys back in Bedford-Stuyvesant knew exactly how to differentiate between what the adults wanted to hear and what their reality was. The challenge is the skills and the access right, to what we would call the mainstream or the commodity of exchange within academia. So they are more than insightful, and in fact, in some ways, because of all that they, many of them have seen and experienced, are probably better at analyzing people than I am. But because there are gaps in what we have asked them to do, they do not navigate as sufficiently or proficiently as they should what we all know to be the commodity of exchange in academia. Their ability to analyze text, 
their ability to construct and problem solve within true content, to apply a lot of those same skills that keep many of them alive to a study of history, a study of biology or chemistry. And so this question of rigor as we push is not one that says more, but one that says, what are the questions that we are supposed to be asking? And what's very interesting to me is that when I have conversations with educators or my neighbors about this idea of rigor, when it is our own children, we are very clear about what we want the end to look like. But somehow, in the words of Lisa Delpit over 20 years ago, when it's other people's children, the answer becomes diluted. So I pose for you the same question I've posed for every principal in Baltimore City and every teacher in Baltimore City. How does your definition of rigor match up to true access and to truly seeing other people's children as the leaders that you expect our own children to be? Second, engagement. And this is a fun one. Because oftentimes when you talk about engagement, people, are, people will say, well, you know, are the kids awake? Are they happy? Are they smiling? But my definition of engagement, the, what I posit to you is really the engagement of leaders, right? Young people who will go on and actually make important change. That definition of engagement is much more about ownership. Do I own my own learning? Can I talk about? Can I uh, twist? Can I bend? Can I take apart? Can I put back together and reconstruct in a way that signals that I own this? This is not just about right, me giving you something back. And what's interesting is, when you talk again to students, and I had a, I had a classroom visit, um, and I won't say which school, I had a classroom visit a couple of weeks ago, where I sat down, and one of my favorite things to do is to shush teachers off, and say, because they always run up and say, let me just tell you what we're doing. And I say, you don't have to tell me what you're doing. It's okay, you go back to doing what you're doing. The kids will tell me what you're doing. So I had a conversation with one young lady, she was a fifth grader. And I asked her, I said, so you know, what are you doing today? Well, you know, we're going through these problems. These, you know, they were doing decimals. And, she, and I said, so you're multiplying, you know, double digit decimals, you know, what's up with that? She said, well, you know, we gotta move this decimal point over and, you know, we plug it here, you count four spaces and then you know to move it over or three spaces, whatever the number of spaces. And I said, so why do you do that? Blank look. Um, got it. I'm not really sure. <laughs> what was great about it, though, was after about four minutes of conversation, plugging away at everything she knew about decimals and place value, she actually constructed, not to my surprise, but to hers, she actually constructed a fairly good meaning of decimals and that algorithmic shift right? that many of us Unfortunately, that's how we learn to multiply two-digit uh, decimals, right? Actually came out with a pretty good understanding. And the best part about it was she went back over to her group and started showing everybody else in the group. That is student engagement. That really is the goal for any young person who we believe should lead. Finally. This idea of interventions, and it's really interesting because when you say interventions, I sometimes shudder a bit because everybody assumes deficit, right? We intervene, police intervene when law and order is jeopardized. And let's see, we intervene in, in medical um, cases, right, when, there's, when the life of the patient is at risk. By interventions, what I mean is supports. And what we have found is that when you actually support a young person in helping to fill some of those skill gaps that in many cases are real, and they're actually real with me. If you were to ask me what my skill gap gaps are, I could tell you, and you may not necessarily see it, because I've learned how to compensate for those skill gaps. 
So one of the pieces that we've really been focusing on is this idea of what are the accurate supports for kids and how do we match them up to those supports. And one of the great examples of that in Baltimore City right now is the Baltimore Urban Debate League. And one of the great uh, elements or aspects of the Baltimore Urban Debate League is they take young people who may have gaps, may not be the best writers necessarily, may not have mastered um, their conventional grammatical construct, right? But what they do is they give them a topic and they show them how to defend. And what's really interesting is when you watch a lot of these young people, they are turned on not because the topic is directly related to them. It's one of the defaults in urban ed, right? We feel like unless we give examples that the kids run into every single day, they can't make the jump. And one of the things about Baltimore Urban Debate League is they start kids there, but then by the end, they're they're making arguments and presentations around things like um, the use of the use of mines in war, right? And uh, certain military operations and the use of biogenetics and what that looks like in real everyday situations. And part of why I love watching young people who are part of Baltimore Urban Debate League is because it's clear that their intervention was not one of remediation of not drill, of not giving them worksheets, but it was one that says, I have high expectations for you. I believe you are capable of this, and now let me frame for you what true academic exchange looks like and give you the skills along the way to engage in it. So what I will say now, as a way of ending and transitioning, is this. The question we have before us, not only as urban educators, but as members of society in general, is what kind of education do we really believe should be in place for young, urban children and youth? I argue that it is an education that develops leaders. Because quite simply, we don't have enough. But beyond that, I would say, Part of why we need urban education to be more than just the holding pens or schools that just, again, keep some kids out of the fray and the mainstream and allow the rest of us to go along their lives is because fundamentally, real leadership, the test of real leadership in the words of Ella Baker, is the extent to which you can grow leadership in others. And so I leave with you the question, are we ready for what it will take to make sure that every young person in Baltimore City is viewed as a leader? It's hard work, it's heavy lifting, but what I would say is that is the work we are engaged in. Thank you. Thank you. Why did you <laughs> wow, didn't I tell you? I think Dr. Alonzo's secret is hiring the right people. She is really something. <laughs>